David Bailey, it is always a joy to talk with you. And I'm excited about the chance we have once again to, to talk about a vision of communities that are all about reconciliation. Yeah, so good to be with you also, John. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. David, I'm wondering if you could sh share a little bit uh, that's coming out of the passion of your ministry at Arabon uh, with all the colleagues there about, um, you know, re really the kind of communities of reconciliation that are so needed in the world today. So I, I realize this is a perennial theme, but yet each year, each season, we, uh, we sharpen the vision for what the Spirit is, is inviting us into. Yeah, you know, um, as we know, Arabine, um, you know, we focus on cultivating the soul of reconciliation. And that, in order to build what we call reconciling communities, it's really, really important that we understand that this is not an information problem. This is a formational problem. Like there's an orientation towards um, being agents of healing, a partner with God um, and the reconciling of all things and not trying to fix the problem of those people out there or, um, or, or this particular person or this particular ideology, but it's actually um, thinking about transformation happens from the inside out. So how do we be agents of reconciliation from the inside out? And that's the area um, where we focus on, again, perennially, but it's needed even more so now. If you're on the left, you hate those on the right. If you're on the right, you hate those on the left. Um, if you think about racism as a, a personal thing, then you dismiss anybody that sees racism as a systemic thing. If you have anybody that sees things as a systemic thing, but don't, uh, uh, um, oftentimes make a accommodation for those who might could be dealing with personal and interpersonal. And so th these are just the challenges that we need to make some traction as the body of Christ to say like, Hey, how can we, you know, do the prayers? Me is me is me, O Lord standing in need of prayer. How can we be the people being transformed? Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things I admire greatly is the, uh, the attention you're giving to institutions, to communities, mm -hmm. but institutions making uh, participating really in a transformational journey. That's a little different than just, you know, gathering with a group of, of friends informally. You know, when, when we kind of do that hard work institutionally, <clears throat> I mean, it feels like a great challenge, but could you say a little bit about your, your hopes and dreams for institutional transformation? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of times when people are issues, talk, talk about issues of race, you know, again, it might be personal, it might be interpersonal, um, or it might be what they call like um, systemic, you know, so think about policy. Well, here's the thing, like um, people form institutions and institutions form people. Yeah. Rarely do folks actually think about, hey, what are the type of institutions that we're forming? And it's not even like, I even find the language of anti-racism to fall short um, because I think particularly from the, from the Christian vision because the Christian vision isn't, isn't just to be what you're against. It's actually centered about what you're for. Yeah. And so, uh, um, you know, I love to be, you know, again, against racism. I mean, like, the, like I'm not saying that we shouldn't be, but what I am saying is it's like, what does it look like for us to actually be a reconciling community, a proactive, a foretaste of the kingdom of God to come? And so what we do is we work with Christian leaders and their communities and their leaders and their staff to, to, to say, hey, what does it look like for us to be a reconciling community, a foretaste of the kingdom of God that's to come in our particular local context? Yeah. So it looks very different in Grand Rapids than yeah. it looks in Richmond, Virginia, that it looks in San Antonio, Texas, that it looks in Seattle, Washington. And um, one, one common theme would be that it is a journey. I mean, it's not yeah. just a uh, go to a workshop and then check that off the list, right? I mean, it's this yeah. lifelong uh, journey. And to me, I, I think one of the great, I'll say joys is really discovering the freedom and saying, this is not something that will be, um, you know, quickly solved by a single event. But no, actually, for the rest of our lives, we're called to this. So can you say a little bit about the, the transformational journey that you really want to invite people into? What's, what, what are, what's the shape of that journey? Yeah, so what we've developed is this thing we call a maturity model, the reconciling community maturity model. And we have these like four stages. Um, 
And generally, when somebody's calling us, they're starting at stage one. It's an understanding, which is a learning focus. He said, we know there's a problem, but aren't sure what it is and what we should do about it. And the big question is, how can we understand and where do we start? Mm -hmm. But then you got stage two. That's a practicing. That's like a doing focus. We have some common knowledge and language and we take action. But the big question is, what is the right thing to do in our context? As you've been trying to figure out what to do in your context, it goes to stage three. That's embodying focus. That's it's, it's just by embodying. That's being focused. And it's we know who we are, what we're living into, and who we are as an organization, a community. The big question is, how can we continue to grow into fuller embodiment? And then stage four is pioneering. That's growing focus. As a community, we learn, grow, and innovate for the sake of the kingdom of God and others. And the big question is, how can we innovate? and multiply our external impact. Mm -hmm. And so these, this is like a journey in which we're all in. And, and one of the things is, is that we oftentimes overestimate what we can do um, in a tweet, maybe yeah. what we can do in a year. We underestimate what we can do in 10 years. Yeah. And so what we're trying to do is help um, <clears throat> Christian institutions think like, okay, how can we not just focus on what kind of tactics we could do in reaction, but um, we don't know if we're doing the right tactics. We don't know if, if we're doing the right strategy. It's hard to get the right strategy if you don't have the shared vision, the right vision. Yeah. And then it's hard to have right vision if you have a shared knowledge, a shared language, you're talking past one another. So actually helping people to go through these stages of getting the right vision for the context, uh, the right strategy for the context, and then say, hey, we're going to do this over the next year but here's where we're trying to go over the next 10 years to be part of not only transformation externally but starting internally and hopefully this has an impact externally yeah david is there a part of that journey that you think um leaders are especially tempted to minimize you know where where you have to really invite people to say no actually let's slow down a minute to really make sure that we're paying attention here to some key elements yeah, you know, if if you're a leader like me, um, you know, we're like, um, you know, we, we just, we go for it. You know, we try to take the mountain, you know, and just try to go for it. And oftentimes uh, um, don't think as strategically as we maybe ought to or, um, but then there's another side to it too. I mean, there's some folks that kind of don't want to disrupt the boat, you know. And I'm concerned about going this direction and what can happen. And it's like, hey, I really want to care for people, you know. Um, but you know, it's like it's been a lot more time spending spending in, in the comforting of folks and not wanting to kind of like disrupt the homeostasis. And so sometimes strategic planning can actually be uh, a way of procrastinating, you know. Right. I actually think for us, what we try to do is do the delicate balance of, you know, it takes a period of time, like about 18 to 24 months, just in any type of institution about anything to get people saying the right thing, to kind of, the, the same thing within any particular type of vision. So we actually intentionally have designed this in a way to kind of take in these like four phases of institution building um, to spend like six weeks as a team journeying together in stage one to get a shared knowledge, shared language, shared vision. And then, you know, get a little bit of time for you to process that and you sign up and do another six weeks to, um, within the strategic leaders, the executive team, the human resource folks to think through, okay, this is what we do uh, um, to actually develop the right strategic plan for being a reconciling community and a human resource plan to, to develop, to, to support that. And then, you know, you spend some time living into that. And then as you get like key volunteers and, and other key people that are maybe not at the core, but that kind of next ring of leadership, then you start to work with those folks to then say, okay, this is what we, um, uh, uh, how you actually help to shepherd and, and lead people through these complicated and challenging issues of race, class, and culture. Uh, that is not only mentally complicated and challenging, it's emotionally complicated and challenging. And, and I think that's oftentimes where people don't give enough uh, pastoral care and credit for things. And this is where things can blow up and oftentimes do blow up. As I hear you talk, I, I, I'm picturing a local leader and the different 
people in their community that they really need to invite in to participate yeah. in this transformational journey. And can you say a little bit about that? And perhaps the, some of the, the, the people that leaders might not think to invite into a process so that it's deeply owned. Yeah, so one of the first things that I want to always encourage folks to do is think about your directional leaders and your staff. You know, your directional leaders, whether it's like your board, your elders, your uh, uh, executive team, like whoever you make, your associate pastors, uh, lead pastor, whoever has the authority to give a red light and a green light to anything, yeah. you want to make sure that you're bringing them on board with you and, and and as particularly as particularly as a, a senior leader you've had a lot more experiences a lot more interactions with a lot of different people so people have experienced the same thing that you've experienced and you're right ready to go and then a lot of the people that you're with aren't where you are and we assume that they're in the same place that we are because we preached it because we spent time with them but just to realize that everybody's on their own journey so one, you got to bring along your directional leaders. You also really need to bring along your staff. If directional leaders and staff aren't together, then when pressure comes, things can break and fall apart. And so that's really important for, again, to say like, hey, this is the vision within our own institution. And this is how we we work through these things and, and, and why we do what we do. But then you got to go to two. Um, you have people who are like, we want to oftentimes go to the congregation, but but instead of going to the the leaders in the congregation, the small group leaders, the deacons, the the um, worship team, the the folks that you know these key volunteers that have bought into to your ministry, bought into your organization, and it's important to shepherd them, you know, to equip them with the tools to be able to lead the others the way that Jesus did it when he cried over the city. He said, the harvest is great, but the labors are few. And the very next chapter, he says, pray to the Lord. He said, pray to the Lord of harvest to send out uh, laborers. And then the very next chapter, he, he finds 72 evangelists. He gives them the power to proclaim the kingdom of God, to, to share the vision and to actually bring healing deliverance. He says, hey, go find some people of peace. And so that is something that like equipping your people to do that. And this is what's important. As leaders, we oftentimes want to get the folks that we agree with the people who we like and they like us, but well, we actually need to get people who um, are influential leaders that even if we don't agree with them, but to help to invite them along the journey to work together, to be part of the shaping and the making of a thing. It's really, really, really important for leaders to do this and then equip folks to, to, to share the vision, to bring healing and to delivering with others people of peace. Yeah, beautiful. David, could you say a bit about the range of institutions that you would um, love to invite into this kind of transformational journey? So range of congregations or other organizations? Yeah, so like, you know, we work with uh, definitely congregations, but denominations, um, city networks, foundations, nonprofits. The key distinction for Airbon is that they just have to have a commitment to being Christian. Yeah, and, and 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 that word Christian needs to mean something like not just only a name, but um, we say, hey, we want to do this in a distinctly Christian way. We just don't want to do this the way that people who don't follow Jesus, um, <laughs> you know, they do it in a way. And I just think I just have the belief system that when when we put that word Christian in front of it, it should look something different than the way people who don't put the word Christian in front of it. And, and, and that, those are the folks who we work with and that type of institutions that we work with. Yeah. Part of what excites me as I hear about that list as the director of the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship is that some of those organizations have worship practices right at the center of what they do. Yeah. Some of those organizations uh, have other things at the center, but of course they are still organizations that shape prayer. and and devotional practices and have a worship dimension to their life. So um, just fully understanding that wide range of, uh, of experiences, could you say a, a word about how devotional practices and Bible engagement and, and worship can participate in this uh, transformational journey? You know, for us, um, if you spend any time around Airbonne, you're going to learn um, is that 
spiritual formation is the foundation for us in reconciliation. That John, if you and I have a conflict, we just can't go after each other, put our religion on the shelf and, and just go after each other. It doesn't matter whether it's about politics, it doesn't matter if it's about racial offense, it doesn't matter if it's about something personal. I mean, we, we have to approach these things as brothers in Christ and not, um, and, and, and leave room for God to work in both of us, not just the other person. Right. And so um, what helps us to do, do this is actually our worship practices, our, um, not just only our singing, not just only our prayer, but our silence, our self-examination, our aspects of um, confession, you know, um, the practice of lament together. You know, John, you and I, I mean, it's, it's kind of wild. I mean, I feel like, I mean, we're probably going on. I feel like I went to the, if I remember correctly, I think I came to the symposium in 2010. Hmm. And so, you know, you and I have, have a lot of mileage now. We have over a decade of mileage together. And uh, man, we've done a lot of lamenting together. There have been times of misunderstandings, you know, and having to talk through difficult, challenging things. Um, but you know i know i can at least speak for myself i'm a i'm a better person you know like you know and also the institute was in a very different place in race relations than they were before i mean they weren't you know y'all were never like hostile but just you know the but um but growing in hospitality um there was a journey and then move from hospitality to actually you know being fellow pilgrims on a journey together. I mean, the Institute has gone in a continuum of, of a journey over the last 10 to 11 years. And so, you know, this is uh, uh, key to our commitments, right? And our commitments to one another. And, you know, I, I think we're richer as a result of doing that. Absolutely. And we're profoundly grateful. And part of the reason we're so excited to really invite many organizations to, um, to participate and and to say, um, Arabon is is a um, is is a wonderful shepherd, and uh, I think of many of us in leadership positions, um, we find it a little easier to think of ourselves as the shepherd rather than the sheep. And what we really need to do is actually say, relinquishing that role of shepherd and uh, and actually following the lead of someone else shaping the journey can be one of the greatest gifts. Not to say it's always easy, but that can be one of right. the most profound gifts of all. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. We're extremely grateful. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so we um, look forward again to continuing to uh, invite people in to learning opportunities that, um, that you're shaping. And uh, is there any additional word of encouragement or, or guidance that you uh, would want to offer? Yeah, I just want to encourage... Uh particularly those who are uh, institutional leaders um, today to, to, to ask yourself the question, this, this vision of being a reconciling community, is this something that you actually have a plan for? Or is this something that you're just uh, are leaving up the chance? If this isn't something that you say like, you know, we really don't have an actual plan or, or a, a, a guide or a way to go about doing this. Just wanna encourage you to say, hey, um, Neck with Arabon, um, it's this partnership with the uh, CICW also helps you to um, help to make this um, an, 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 an easier opportunity to engage in. And this is really important work um, to engage in, not just today, not just for one workshop, but to engage in over the next few years. Wonderful. Well, we will continue to pray, David, for the Spirit's blessing on all of this. And uh, I'm already looking forward to the next decade of, uh, of learning and ministry together. Likewise, my friend. God bless.